Good afternoon. I have to click somewhere. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm talking about asset DIDs and give some use cases for it. So first question is probably what's an asset DID? Um, to understand asset DIDs, I think we first have to understand what decentralized identity is. Actually, the clicker doesn't work. Ah, now it works. Well, so what is decentralized identity or digital identity? It always starts with what we call an identifier. An identifier is what would be in the physical world, for example, your face or your fingerprint or your signature. So this is something which is naturally decentralized, right? So it, your fingerprint is not given to you by a government. It's not given to you by a big company. <clears throat> you make it yourself. And then you have those identifiers, you can clearly identify a person. And when you have this, then you can add verifiable credentials to that. Verifiable credentials could be a passport which is issued by your government. It could be a university degree which is issued by your university. It could be a library card which is issued by your public library. So all these things which issue them are trusted entities. And the cool thing about the physical world is that you really get those credentials, right? You have them in your pocket, you have them in your drawer, and you can show them at any occasion to anyone that you want and that you may be trust um, for proving whatever you want to prove at that time. So it gives the people a lot of power in the physical world. In the digital world, as you might have noticed, the digital identity sits with some big companies, uh, which is totally wrong and which is one of the big flaws of the Web 2. And this is why we are moving into the Web 3, because in the Web 3, we will have control over, over, over our identity again. So um, it is necessary that you produce your own identifiers on your computer. This is what you do with an identity wallet. Then if you have this, you can collect digital credentials or verifiable credentials, which you collect again in your identity wallet. And then you use your identity wallet for sharing this. So now if you think this a little bit further, then you can say, of course, those um, digital identities can not only apply to persons, they could also apply to things like physical goods, and of course also virtual goods, like for example, NFTs. And at that point, it really becomes interesting. So maybe a little bit of a sidestep towards XCM. Um, we have heard a lot about Polkadot and parachains today. So Kilt is a parachain uh, on Kusama. And uh, the cool thing about the uh, Polkadot ecosystem is that the individual parachains, they are not general purpose, right? They are one purpose. And Kilt is a blockchain which takes care about anything identity. So if we do this, then we cannot stop at saying person identity. We also have to go into thing identity. And of course, we also have to communicate with other uh, blockchains in the Polkadot ecosystem, because altogether we are like an ecosystem where you can get everything, and uh, identity is a fundamental piece of it. So other blockchains can use us, and we will see later how that will actually work. Um, so talking about identity. So when you look at other ecosystems, like for example Ethereum, you find something like ENS, the Ethereum name service, which is a little bit from a point of view of a computer scientist, it's a little bit strange that it would be ingo.eth there, um, because that is actually not in your eye, and you would expect in your eye. Um, but let's take it as it is. This ENS points to one Ethereum address. You know that. Probably you have one. Um, we have a different concept for that in Kilt, not only in Kilt, like uh, a lot of companies are using this uh, system. It's called DIDs, Decentralized Identifiers. These are the identifiers. They look a little bit like a crypto address, if you can see that. And they are far more powerful than, for example, ENS. Why is that? First thing, uh, with a DID, you cannot link to only one address, you can link to multiple addresses. Addresses on Moonbeam, addresses on Polkadot, on Kusama, uh, on uh, Kilt, if you want. Uh, you, you can link them to all of them. It's much more like you have your identifier, and these are then, this are in the physical world, this is linked to many different bank accounts. So you are a little bit more open. It doesn't stop there. 
We also find a way, found a way to actually link it to, the uni to a unique human-readable name. We call that the Web3 name, W3N. And this is a URI, as you see. Um, so you have the schema, you have the colon, and then you have the path. This is a one-to-one -one connection to a DID. So the kill blockchain takes care that um, one DID is only connected to one um, W3N. And then the DID can be connected to several addresses. Of course, not only in the Polkadot ecosystem, can also be connected to an Ethereum address, which makes it pretty practical. And then comes the big step. You can connect verifiable credentials from different trusted entities to your DID. And then they are valid for all your crypto addresses, which makes the concept, I think, far more powerful. Doesn't really end there. There's another feature of the DIDs. You can also have service endpoints connected to a DID that could be, for example, your website, that could be a communication channel, which is always open where people can reach you. Uh, so these things are all integrated in the DID concept, which makes it a little bit more powerful than, for example, ENS. Um, and this is all there in the Parker ecosystem, right? This is pretty nice. Um, now let's think about things. So the upper part of this slide um, you see you have the Ingo there, uh, you have the W3N of Ingo, and then you have a couple of credentials of Ingo. For example, saying, I own this Twitter account, I own this Discord account, I own this email address. So making it even more plausible that I am I. Um, with an asset, you start a little bit different. Uh, let's make an example of an NFT. So if you have an NFT, it has an NFT ID. Um, but this can be forged, or this can be counterfeit, because you could have another contract on the same chain, another smart contract, which produces NFTs as well. And so there could be another NFT with the same number, right? So if you have just the NFT number, you really don't know which NFT you're talking to. Then, of course, NFTs have different standards, like the ERCs. Um, so there could be only one contract, but there could produce two NFTs with the same number and different um, types. And of course, there could be different chains, like, for example, the Moonbeam uh, EVM chain and the Ethereum EVM chain, and they both run the same contract and both produce the same NFT. Right? So actually, what you need to really identify an NFT is four pieces of information, the chain ID, the type of the NFT, the contract ID, and the NFT ID. And if you separate those by colons, this is what we call an asset DID. So now you can clearly identify an NFT. Nice. Not much one, actually. Well, counterfeiting is now more complicated. But the real power comes in when you add credentials to these NFTs. Because when you do that, then you could, um, can make um, like uh, properties of a of an NFT and then link this to the NFT. And even if the NFT is then sold, maybe, or it changes ownership through the smart contract, what you, what you linked before to it will stay there. What's that good for? So in this simple example, the W3N Ingo DID says, I like this JPEG. Not very valuable. Let's make a and let's make an example which is a bit more valuable. So the Ingo comes and creates an NFT. And then, of course, does this on a well-known uh, marketplace. Um, and then the marketplace could actually go and say, I issue a credential which says that exactly this DID, Ingo, is, uh, created this piece of work. And then it will always be connected with this NFT no matter who owns it at this point in time. And that could be, if I'm a great artist, which I'm not, um, could be a valuable thing to have been connected. Let's make an even better use case. So here we have a watch manufacturer. And this watch manufacturer produces a watch and then attaches an NFT to the watch, maybe QR code on the back or something, and then issues a credential on the blockchain saying this thing was actually produced by this manufacturer. Now, if I go 
and buy this thing, buy this uh, watch, then the watch manufacturer would go and, say, and transfer their ownership on the smart contract of this NFT to me. So now I own a watch and an NFT. Well, is that good? Because if someone steals my watch and then tries to sell it on the secondary market, he will have a hard time because he doesn't have the NFT. So he doesn't officially own it, right? So I have an owner certificate which is stored on the blockchain. So that makes it a bit more powerful again. So you can think of even crazier things. You can um, imagine a world, maybe a bit in the future, where it is possible that a notary service issues a credential to an NFT saying this uh, a specific house in London is attached to this NFT. Then you can go on a market and sell the NFT and you're actually selling the house with the NFT because the credentials always stick to the asset DID. So I think this is a really powerful thing and it has the potential to bring the NFT market to a state where it is a little bit beyond a JPEGs. And this is why um, we started to build this thing. Um, a big thank you to the Parity team, which actually brought us to brought this thing to our attention. Um, uh, the asset DID is, is uh, not only working for NFTs, it's also working for everything that is an asset on the blockchain. So that could be an account, that could be a parachain slot, that could be anything. So it's it's broad, <coughs> um, and also those on-chain uh, credentials, we call them, they are usable for anything that has an asset DID. So, coming back to XCM, if we have that, what could we actually do with XCM? So, we could have a DAP talking in the Moonbeam space, for example, um, producing on a smart contract there, on their EVM, an NFT, and then you can do things with these NFTs, uh, with these NFTs, like connecting an asset DID, uh, like um, issuing credentials and stuff like that directly in the smart contract on Moonbeam without the necessity of the DAP ever connecting to the Kilt blockchain. It all goes via the relay chain. You're just talking to this one um, interface of the Moonbeam network, and the Moonbeam network takes care about everything that's happening behind that. You don't need to care a lot about Kilt. Kilt is just happening without anybody seeing it. So that is the principle behind that. And that was already the talk. So <laughs> thank you very much.